So I have uh, a couple of icebreakers, even though we've been talking a little bit already. I've got a couple of icebreakers for you. Um, you know, just some weird off the top, off the wall questions that maybe no one's ever asked you before. Um, just to kind of get us going here um, and see where the evening takes us. Uh, have you ever been arrested? No. No. Have you ever been close? Um, no. Good boy. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, there's a time that there is one time that I should have been probably, but I just think I was lucky in the right place at the right time. I don't know how you'd say that, but like, uh, yeah, probably should have been uh, in the middle. Of, like it was college buddy and I and our girlfriend's wives now um, drinking. And long story short, a couple guys tried to pick a fight with us. We were just kind of minding our own good fight ended up in the road um and my buddy was on the ground the guy was kind of getting after him and I came up behind him and got like on his back and I like as hard as I could hit him right in the face and just felt everything come out of his body <laughs> and it's the only time I've ever hit anybody like that um and it was pretty pretty intoxicated um and I was like if there was ever it was a welcome week weekend for a college and if i was if there was ever a cop round that would have been the time <laughs> you mind me asking what college cmu oh man so many shenanigans at cmu <laughs> central girls that's the not... ones i like <laughs> have you most of my song? buddies <laughs> no but i gotta figure that one out who is that it's uh oh, i knew you're gonna ask me that's okay uh, uh most of my buddies went to central and so there was a lot of a lot of intoxicated evenings in Mount Pleasant back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. That was a situation. Honestly, I don't a situation. We should probably never been in, but we were literally just mind our own business. We were actually dropping our girlfriends. Uh, they had a friend. We were dropping her off. Our wives, well, girlfriends at the time were driving. They really weren't drinking. It was just my buddy and I, and we were dropping her off while she was walking up and it's late. I mean, it's like two o'clock in the morning and these drunk guys came by and started kind of like hitting on her a little bit and like, didn't know her, just kind of like doing some weird shady stuff to her. Well, my buddy got out and he's like, Hey, don't be messing with her. And the guy speared him into the road, like downtown Mount Pleasant. And I'm like, Oh God. And I can't just sit there with my buddy as he's on the ground, you know, and this guy's like, so I just went over there and, not uh, a bad I, I tried. Beautiful. I gave him everything I had. <laughs> well, you know, um, talk about minding your own business. That is how this happened. I was. Oh, really? Yeah, I was in. Uh, it was 1999, and it was a week before my senior graduation, like open house that my you know that my parents were having for me. Mm -hmm. and, um, so in Clarkson is Pine Knob, which a lot of people don't know what Pine Knob is, but it's an outdoor amphitheater. Um, it's like a major stop on most touring bands lists. And Didn't they change the name to that? Yeah, they changed it to the DT Energy Music Theater for a really long time. But it's that's been, right. It came back to Pine Knob. Oh, it is. I mean, it's got to be Pine Knob. It's whatever. What it's been forever. You there know, was, I knew most people were like I'm not calling it. I'm not calling it that. So yeah. They just, yeah. Uh, so, but living here, if a concert wasn't sold out, you could go to a party store just you know outside the the entrance to Pine Knob. And they would have stacks of complimentary tickets. So as a kid growing up in Clarkston, you could just go to free concerts all the time. And if you could grow any semblance of a mustache, you could probably get alcohol uh, <laughs> underaged. And I was no joke. I was walking on the top of the hill with some friends and someone grabbed me from behind, spun me around. And before I could even see who it was, there was a fist in my mouth and it just cracked my four front teeth in half. Really? Which, yeah. Which then led to a massive brawl on the hill. And then I had to, you know, I had to go home and tell my parents that my teeth were all screwed up. And then, you know, you know, 30 years, 25 years later, I had to get my tooth pulled. So that's how this happened. Holy cow. It was, a, it was a beach boys credence, Clearwater revival concert. Yeah. Oh, CCR. Let's go. Nothing, nothing wilder. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome it happened, man. all right so question number two I, I know you're younger than me um but did you ever have a myspace page and if you did can you remember what the mute the song was playing when people would go to your page 
I did have a MySpace page. So my freshman year of college would have been like Facebook was a thing, but it, so my, I think Facebook came out, I want to say it was like 2006, which was my senior year, which 2005 was mostly my senior, but I graduated in 2006. My freshman year of college was 2007. MySpace was like the thing then. Facebook mm -hmm. really wasn't much of anything. Like if you didn't have a MySpace, you weren't cool kind of thing. And the song was, it was one of two, but I think it was Photograph, I think is what it was. The Kid Rock song with Sheryl Crow? No, 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 no. Oh, Nickelback. Uh, Nickelback. Oh, no, dude, the, yeah. The kid rocks on this picture. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. yeah. So Nickelback, even to this day, dude, Nickelback comes on the yeah. on the radio. Just just shut up. I'm gonna listen. You know. <laughs> they get a bad rap, but they, they make do, some dude. great rock and roll. Have you watched the documentary on them on Netflix? No. You got to. If you like Nickelback, you got to. They fun fun fact actually, the first professional quote unquote when I got hired full time. The first trip I ever went on to film was in Hannah, Alberta. I think it is where they're from. And when you drive into town, I didn't, I didn't know that's where they were from. When you drive into town, this big sign and there's this town is not very big. And it says home of like Nickelback lead singer and all that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, so I've been hey. there and they're from Canada or whatnot. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. The documentary. I love dude, Nickelback shit. Give that to me all day. Dude, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that you remember the song that was playing on your MySpace page. Well, it was either Nickelback or it was Three Doors Down. Um, uh, um, God, what is that song from Three Doors Down? Some good ones. I'll look it up. But anyway, yeah, it was one of Superman? those. Is that is that the name of it? I'm looking it up right now. I got it. Um, it is. Kryptonite. Kryptonite. Yeah. Kryptonite. So I was, again, I was, man, I'm so, like on the cusp of being able to figure these out. Yeah. Kryptonite was there. Man, Three Doors Down was a banger too, man. That was just my time. Loved it. Do you go down? Are you a music guy? Like a big music guy? Like you love to listen to music? Does music mean a lot to you? Music meant way more than more to me before podcasts came out. Like mm -hmm. I still listen to music, um, but. I wouldn't know a lot of the new stuff out unless I haven't heard it on TikTok or somebody told me about it. Like I've got buddies that like they get like a exclusive drop music before it even hits stuff, and I'm like, what? And the, like, you know, that's their thing though. But I, I don't know. I live in the past. Like I love like the old Fifty Cent, mm -hmm. Ti, you know, all that stuff back when I was in sure. high school and and um. You know, like I said, or um, Nickelback, Daughtry. I was a Daughtry fan. I don't know if that's good to say that. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't say I'm a big music enthusiast, but there's a good banger on. I'm I'm gonna probably play it until the wheels fall off. Do you have a Do you have a song that you play every opening morning? No, I mean every opening day of rifle season. It doesn't matter where I'm at. Like we're gonna be in Illinois this year on the 15th of November. I'm gonna play Fred Bear. Hell like yeah. I just had because you know how music kind of puts you in a place. I do like that. That's what I love. That's what I love. There are some songs out there that put me in our driveway of our deer camp, driving back on a October evening, wet, kind of little cold. You know, you can see the leaves change in they're falling. It's a little windy. There's a couple songs that put me there. It doesn't matter where I'm at in the world. It puts me there. Should I listen to one? We were on spring break in Florida this last year. We were on the beach. It's like a hundred degrees out. And all of a sudden this song comes on and I'm like, I'm back at the cabin. It's October right now. And I called wow. DJ. I'm like, dude, I'm ready to hunt, you know? And it's like March. <laughs> it's yeah. like, so. so, so you're going to Illinois at during the opener of Michigan's gun season. Yes. Interesting. Are you going to bow hunt? Because they don't, that's yes. not their gun season, is it? I no. Like the their next. gun season, I think, starts like the 22nd, maybe 23rd yeah. of November. Um, And we're trying it just something a little different, you know? Yeah. Uh, Reason why is because 
everybody goes that first week, you know, and I've not hunted a lot, you know, in the time frame we're going because in Michigan, it's just instilled in our head when the opener of gun season is, is on your season kind of dwindling, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, to me, like in Michigan, there isn't a rut after the 14th of Michigan or 14th of November, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I want to go somewhere and experience that in that time when the guns are banging, you know, back home. So oh, I'm, I'm, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that one. Yeah. It kind of extends the season, the bow season a little bit, you know, yeah, I feel that, you know, so. um, I haven't known you for very long. In fact, I don't know that I would say that I know a lot about you. Um, and so I think there's probably a lot of people, though, that have listened to Aaron Blisey on the fall podcast from day one. And I've listened to a lot of, of your podcasts. I really have. Mm-hmm. I've listened to you on other podcasts. And I know little nuggets of information about you and your history and sort of your experience in in not just the podcast game, but in the hunting industry as a whole. And um, since I don't really know your origin story, you know, like I know we know Batman's and we know Superman's and we know Spider-Man's, but yeah. Can you give me like the origin story for Aaron Blisey and how you came into the industry and what brought you here today? Yeah. I mean, can kind of get long winded. So hopefully you have a little bit of time. Um, it's it start it honestly starts back, you know, growing up watching hunting shows on Saturday morning on ESPN. You know, Real Tree was a big driver of it. Uh, and then when the DVD thing hit, you know, Primos, I loved Will Primos, Brad Ferris, their whole crew. It's just what I love to watch. And when I was 16, my best friend at the time, his name is Brandon Tillman. Uh, him and I were hunt buddies. We went to high school together. We did everything together. Um, I said, hey, do you want to go out and film a, a a deer hunt? And we were baiting back then, you know, we were 16 years old and up at my family farm and had a preset tree stand hung and and hung another tree stand. And he's like, Well, what are the odds of us killing something? I said, Well, let's kill a doe. I mean, it's we'll kill whatever comes in, kind of thing. I was so eager to like just get something on film. Well, <clears throat> this doe comes in and shooter and get all the footage and everything and honestly it was just hit record on the kill shot and then that was it like i don't even we didn't even get a recovery or nothing it was just like walking in eating the bait shooting and um took it to school and you know being a sophomore at the time like it was my one of my football coaches was our video productions we had a video productions class at our high school and he's like why don't you like edit that together and, and, uh, put a song to it or whatever. And, and, uh, put it on our announcements for our school. So the whole schools can see it, you know, on homeroom for lunch. And I'm like, really, you know, it wasn't even a question. I'm like, yeah, let's now it'd be like, how do you think they would imagine? Oh my gosh. Like it'd be wild. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, that's insane and amazing. Yeah. Back. It is. And we're, our school is a big ag school, big F big into FFA and all that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of kids there that were, you know, kind of the country lifestyle. Sure. And uh, so I did that and it was received really well. And um, like ever since then, I was like, man, I want to, well, I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to play col- or college baseball and go to the pros. I mean, that was, that was the goal. That wasn't going to happen, but um I wanted to do something with filming and hunting back when I was 16. So, you know, I just kept filming stuff and not really knowing how to film, just borrowed a camera from a family friend. Honestly, we didn't even have enough money to buy a camera. And so then I went my freshman year to Muskegon community college and played baseball for one year there and then decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Ended up quitting coming back to, back home and I went to Ferris where fair state, they have like one of the best video production uh, programs in the country. It's really good. And uh, they had a club baseball team and um, they wanted me to play. So I played baseball for three or two or three more years there and, um, and got my degree in filming. And, Hmm. and, you know, as I was in college, like the, you know, the baseball sports scene, I was still doing it, but it was kind of, 
it that dream was fading as the video thing was still growing, you know, and it was just like they were kind of like they were kind of going separate directions and I knew the baseball thing wasn't going to last. It was just something you were doing. Had a lot of fun doing it, traveled all over doing it and um you know, come to come to the end of my degree, it got to the point where it's like, okay, I got to start looking at where I want to do internships and I had three places in mind. I wanted to either go to Bone Collector with Mike Waddell, uh, Buck Commander, because being a big baseball guy, you know, Chipper Jones and Matt Duff and Tombo Martin and Ryan Langerhands and Adam LaRoche, like they were like that was they were the dudes I wanted to be. Like they were hunters, baseball guys. Al Dean was part of it, you know, Luke Bryan. Like I wanted to work for them. So and then the Kiefers in Midland and not knowing much about Chris and Casey at the time, just knowing that they were in Michigan. Um, I was kind of a homebody, you know, didn't really want to leave much. Well, I went to ATA that year before I started doing the internship. I met Willie Robertson. He gave me his card, talked to him about filming for Buck Commander. And then I met Waddell and his producer and stuff like that, got his card. And I'm like, okay, so I have a little bit of in here. Sent my cover letters, my demo reels, all that stuff to everybody. Well, Chris and Casey, well, it was Jason Brown um, is the third owner with Chris and Casey. He was the producer. He went to CMU, got his degree, the same degree I have basically. And, and uh, he called me right away and was like, would love to have you come in for, uh, for an interview or looking for an intern. It's great. You know, so went and did the interview, um, they're like, we want to, we want you to come on. And those, the other two never called me back. And okay. I was like, okay, you know, so that makes it a little easier. And yeah. looking back, dude, I'm so glad I did what I did. You know, like I had an amazing tenure with the, with the Kiefer's. They taught me a ton. JB taught me a lot. Uh, great experience, traveled all over the world. Um, it was awesome. And uh, so I went there, I had to do a six month internship for, to finish my degree. And they hired me after two months. Sweet. So, and then we kind of, finished out everything there. And, and then, uh, I, I think I worked for him for 11, almost 12 years. I think I can't remember the fight. It was 11 between 11 and 12. And then, you know, I went to work for Mark Peterson for a year and now with latitude doing the same thing. So that's kind of in a nutshell, that's, that's kind of yeah. how it all went. So when you say that you sent a cover letter and some demo reels to these, these companies, can you tell me what were your demo reels of? So this is where going back, if I knew what I know now, I would have definitely done a little different. But like when you when I went to that program, so I was I was the outsider in my degree. Like it was a lot of news people, a lot of like no no kids that looked like me. Like yeah. there was no I kind of put myself in like kind of the the rural country bucket. They mm -hmm. were very much like inner city um kids that were trying to get placed at news centers or news stations and Ferris placed a lot of people at ESPN as well. Um, so that was an avenue too, but I, I just didn't want to go into live sports. I didn't really care for the live video aspect. Um, and honestly, dude, I was so tunneled vision to hunting ever since I was 16. I'm like, this is what I want to do. Like did you, that's did it. Did you see though, did you, were you, were you looking at it from a long-term perspective through a lens of like, yes, sports has always been sports has always been sports and will always be sports. But like this hunting thing, like I, I could still realistically get in and kind of ride this way for the long term. Was it still, was that something you were thinking about or was it not really on your brain at that time? It was definitely a long-term play, but it was also like, so Ferris, you know, you're a hockey guy, like Ferris is D one hockey. And when I was there, they made it to the frozen four, I think like twice, like we were legit and we were always covering their games live, like in the truck, okay. you had like everything. And I, I just didn't, and even football, like we had, we were doing the football games and I just did not like grasp onto it. I'm like, I love sports, but I'm like, the hunting was something that there was just always like something there that I could never grab and like physically always see. I don't know what it was, but I just wanted to keep going for that. Yeah. And I don't know what it was. A uh, sports, you turn on the TV every day, you see sports every day. Sure. Like 
ESPN, whatever. You, I'm watching live sports all the time. Hunting, yeah, you're watching it, but it was there was there was like a like a nostalgia about it for me. It was just like there was something I I wanted to conquer. Don't know what it was. Like maybe it's because I played sports so much and you know, and I've been there, kind of like done that scene, and I'm like, I just didn't really want to do that. So were you getting a lot of support from home uh, on this maybe unconventional method for education and maybe career path? hundred percent. I mean, my nice. wife, my wife now and my girlfriend at the time, um, she was with me. We started dating in 2009. So like when I really started getting into my, my senior sequence classes and really getting into the nitty gritty, she was like, her and I were very, you know, very much ramping up our relationship. And like she, from day one, I mean, she, you know, was very supportive and we lived together back then basically, okay. you know, and it's, and she was going for a nursing degree, but my dad, my dad was a big hunter, big sports mm. guy, but still for, for those people, it was always like, st I'm not gonna lie to you, Brett. There's still people to this day. I'm like 14 years into this career that they're like, what do you do again? Like, do you even have a real job? I've literally had people ask me like, do you have a real job? And I'm like, who the hell are you to yeah. say like, like people, my dad was a big support. My whole family was, they were, they were really supportive, but I also think it was what I was trying to chase of like, there's something there that people haven't seen that were, that they want to see, you know, and they can, I, I don't know. It, it's, I don't, I don't even know how to explain it, but yeah, they were very supportive. Very like at, at one time I was going to quit college and and I was going to go because it was when video, um, like video course, like Heartland Bowhunter did like their video classes. And it's like a long weekend thing that you come and learn, you pay money to go to, and then you get like a certificate or whatever afterwards. I was going to quit college and I was going to go do one of these weekend things. And I was like, oh, I'm done. But my dad was like, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Like, you're going to finish this out. You need this you know, and my sister was the same way and my wife and girlfriend at the time. And they're like, why, why would you do that? You know, and, um, finish it out, you know, and like, all right, it sucked then, you know, but now looking back, I'm like to get that expensive piece of paper, I'm still using my degree, you know, I'm still, you still paying for it too. <laughs> so, Are you really? Oh yeah. 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 Um, but the demo reel thing back to that though, like, so what I would do differently is like, what I was saying is like, I was like kind of on the outside looking in, like I would come back home and I'd film hunts in the, and do outdoors things, film outdoors things. And then we'd always have to come and present our projects to the class. And everybody's like, I mean, we had goth, goth people. We had, you know, whatever. I don't even want to say it because it probably get canceled, but we had a lot of different forms of people in there, which I, I didn't look at them any differently, but they looked at me a little different. Like, huh like showing them showing a dead deer dragon or mm -hmm. but at the end of it i'm not gonna lie there was a lot of people that have never seen hunting or seen that that side of things that were like they were looking at my production and like oh that's really cool like that's a cool shot that's a cool mm -hmm. edit like they didn't almost they didn't really care for the subject like that like the production almost overrided the subject and i'm like sure or the substance of it and i'm like man that's kind of neat like changing the perspective for people through the lens of telling a story, you know, so that was really cool. Yeah. But looking back, like we had to do a lot of these projects and a lot of them were like shooting commercials for, you know, pizzerias in town and stuff like that. So that was like what a lot of my demo reel was stuff that I didn't give a shit about that. I didn't really want to do looking back and I wish I would have done more filming um, and I did a lot of filming, but I wish I would have did more filming outdoor stuff and had that as my demo reel. Cause when you, dude, I pulled up my demo reel about a year ago and looked at it. I was like, dude, I'd never hire this kid. Like this kid is, it looks like shit, you know? Um, but you're 14 years in the game at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you, if you, I, I always say, if you ever look back at your stuff, even that you did a year ago and you're like, man, I crushed that. Like you should, you should always be like, critiquing yourself on stuff yeah. you did like why did i do that like what was i thinking there you know um so well, that that was what i wanted to know is if you're if you were 
going home and recording like hunts or outdoor stuff that because you knew you were going to use it for demo reels or like you said you were doing pizzeria reels and stuff that's that's interesting to me that you were able to use that and you were able to get your talent across into the industry in which you wanted to go into I, that's fascinating to me yeah yeah i definitely we, we had um um uh, it's called media supply we could at the college we had cameras at our disposal that we could rent out well <laughs> if you would have seen some of the cameras that I was running out to put 20 feet in a tree and if they would have known about it, I never told anybody like, and luckily, oh, really? oh no, no. I mean, they could probably put two and two together. Oh, Aaron's out there shooting, but you know, a little fib to hear. Oh yeah. I bought my, you know, I bought a camera and I've been using that and mm -hmm. whatever, but like, yeah, I, every weekend, dude, I was renting out cameras <laughs> to take back home and carry them through the woods. Like That's that awesome. was, and at the end of the day, I look back at it now, I'm like, shit, like as much as I paid to go there, like the least you could do is let me take your camera and, you know, so I was renting cameras, renting mics, doing whatever I had to do and just kind of going winging it, man. Like coming into my senior year, we had to do this, um, we had to do a, a senior project, like our end of the year project. Well, I wanted to make a feature length film. I wanted to you know, white cell adrenaline was coming out at that time. Um, and I wanted to do something like that. I wanted to make a DVD because back then DVDs were the shit. Hell yeah. Um, I wanted to make a DVD with my buddies in one season. I wanted to see how many animals we could kill in Michigan. And I wanted to put it all together. So we made a hunting team called mainframe outdoors. And I did all the artwork. Didn't even know how to do it. Did all the artwork for the DVD we got 28 kills between Michigan bear, deer, and turkeys in one season. And it was like my buddy self-filming, me self-filming, my wife filming, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now filming me, me filming her. And I put all this footage and I, I edited it in my bedroom of my college house and handed it in and passed. And then I honestly, that was kind of my demo reel. Like I sent that to the keepers and stuff like that. And that, I think that was a pretty big deal. Um, it's terrible, oh, wow, absolutely oh. terrible. Like it's like nails on a chalkboard to watch it. But, um, we, uh, we produced them. We made a booth. We did the Michigan shows that year. We sold DVDs. Um, I had a mass produced at the time. I, we sold a couple thousand DVDs and that was cool. We did like the Lansing show, the Grand Rapids show. There was one show up North and that was kind of neat, you know, and, uh, that was it. <laughs> and where are they today? I've got some still here. What, but... what, how much can I Venmo you to mail me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you one. I've got Come them still. On. In the, I've still got them in the cellophane still. Some of them. I mean, we didn't sell all of them, but, um, we had uh we had a bear archery was a sponsor of ours. We got a, a we got a, a they were they get, gave us bows at like you know we could get a flagship bow for like five hundred bucks. You know buck stop sense at the time they were another one. Um, There's a couple of them. It was cool though. It was a lot of fun. It was it was young Aaron and his buddies and and it was cool. It's a good time to be alive. That is you aren't kidding. And I think you, you, you touched on something there that I, I think, I think a lot about today, you know, cause I, I, I look back and think I, lo I missed, I lost out on 13 years of, of like young Brett years where I could have been a little more vibrant out there and doing a little more things. I just, it wasn't something that we did when I lived in Florida. It wasn't even on my mind. Mm -hmm. So I think about all those things that man, maybe I could have done uh, back in the day. And I, I, I kind of, I'm trying to cram it all in to my mid forties now and yeah, catch up and, and, and experience all these things. You know, you, you talked a little bit about traveling all over the world um, with these folks and, and yeah, what, what, you know, outside of doing this passion, the, you know, filming and documenting all these things, what are some of the things that you did as you traveled around the world um, that are some just incredible memories that you know, maybe some of your favorite memories as you traveled around? Um, so South Island of New Zealand was a cool one. Um, I went there, we were there for almost two weeks hunting tar and chamois and red stag. Um, the group of guys I was there with awesome group of guys. They're from Texas. Um, I don't know if you know what a tar is. Uh, no. 
so you have to look it up, but it's a really cool animal. They almost have like a mane. It's like a goat. I think it's in the mm. goat family. Um, but we were out in the Wanaka Valley uh, in New Zealand, and this was a big one. Um, I filmed a guy shoot the third biggest tar in the world, free range, and it ended up dying in a waterfall. And it was like amazing, you know, like some of these waterfalls that like people have never seen before, oh, yeah. you know, um, that was a cool one. And they actually last day of the hunt, they let me shoot a Ram myself. They like, we were out, there was this Ram we were watching. Uh, it's an hour power Ram. I don't even, I can't even say it very well, but, uh, it's got curls, it, like curls out. And, um, the last day of the hunt, they're like, Hey, we, we named him Harley. Cause he looked like he had Harley handlebars <laughs> yeah. and, uh, He's like, you want to go shoot Harley? And I'm like, are you serious? Like, yeah, let's go. So we went out there and stalked him. And it was kind of cool. And then they ended up surprising me that year is the year I got married. They got him mounted for me and for a wedding gift, they sent it to me. So that was kind of neat. So I got him mounted and everything. Um, that was a cool trip. Uh being on dropped, um, the show that we did with the Kiefers for you know, being out there for 28 days with no food was a lot of fun. That was a that was a trip that I'll never forget. Um, there's a lot of good ones, man. I've been to Alaska a few times. I've been to Italy, pheasant hunting, and like the mountains of Italy uh, mm. behind some of the the best dogs you would ever see work a pheasant, a free range on mountain sides, you know. So that was pretty neat. Um, I've been to every province in Canada, basically hunting or filming uh, whitetail, moose, elk. Um, Mule deer, mule. There's a lot of cool mule deer instances. Um, whitetail, and I'd have to think about my favorite whitetail story. Uh, there's some good ones. I'd have to probably say, man, Illinois, 2013. Uh, I filmed Casey shoot 175 inch uh, deer we called strong arm. It's on, if you go on YouTube to the Kiefer brothers, YouTube channel, go back to season one, arrival wild and watch the strong arm hunt. Really cool. And then the season two, um, Illinois, again, I filmed Casey shoot 183 inch eight point with some flyers. Uh, and we hunted that deer for 18 days on one farm and only saw him like three days and ended up killing him. Um, got skunked like all but three days, basically. It was a really cool grueling hunt. But uh, and that deer's name is Megatron. Um, so that those are probably the coolest whitetail stories that I remember. Did you get to do a lot of extracurriculars when you were traveling around the world like that? Like As of like, off days, did you get to go explore Italy and ride one of uh, the boats that goes around the town? Italy, we did a little bit, but the thing is, Brett, though, like for a lot of the shows I was doing, I always had to film. There was never like, I mean, there was might have been a day here or there where you can just kind of let your hair down and leave the camera, but I always felt guilty if I didn't have the camera with me, you know? And I pushed it sometimes because I'm like, man, I'm like on someone else's dime over here. Like, I want to experience it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yes and no. But a lot of the stuff I was doing was all of it needed to be covered, mm -hmm. you know? So for me and for some guys, some producers, they might be able to say differently. But for me, it was really hard for me to, to take my view out of the, out of the viewfinder and like really take the whole picture. in. I was, you know, I experienced a lot of that stuff through a three and a half inch LCD screen. Mm -hmm. That's the best way I can put it. Do you regret that? I do a little bit because I'm not going to lie to you. I don't want to travel anymore. Like even to go on spring break with my family and this is nothing against my family. I, it's just, I'd rather not that I'd rather not because it's with my family. It's because I just hate the travel. I hate the airport. I hate all the logistics. I, it stresses me out. I'm, I'm not like a stress ball when I do it because when I'm with my family, I've done it enough to where I can do it kind of in my sleep and my family relies on me to be the leader of that. So I just do it. You know what I mean? And I have no problem doing that. Yeah. But like my wife and I, when we retire, if we ever get to retire, we've always talked like we're trying to, you know, with a financial planner, we're trying to like get to the point when we retire that we can travel the world. Kind of gives me a little anxiety. I hope it comes back to where like I want to travel again, because honestly, dude, I, I don't want to leave. <laughs> I just, 
it, it was, you got to think like a lot of the, all the stuff I did was for work, you know? So even though it was beautiful and I was out there doing it and seeing some, some of the most gorgeous places in the world, it was at the end of the day I was working though. So it was like, I have a love hate with it. Sure. Was it hard to get rid of that extension on your hand, that camera and on your arm? Was it hard to break that when you finally got out of that? It's still hard to this Is day. Is it really? It, yeah. It's every season I go into, I have an internal battle with myself that I'm not going to film because hmm. lat latitude, they don't tell me I have to film. Like even Alex, will, he'll be like, Hey, why don't you get yourself a cameraman? So you don't have to self film yourself. Yeah. And I'm just like, I just don't want to do that. Like, I feel like if I don't film it at some capacity, whether it's just even hitting record and if I don't film it, then I feel like I'm not really doing, doing it, I mm. guess. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I've been filming my stuff basically just about every hunt with an exception of a couple since I was 16. So, you know, 21 years, I think, isn't that right? I'm 37 now. Yeah. Sounds years. great to me. So I've been filming just about every one of my hunts. I'd say 90, 90 to 95% of the hunts that I've actually had a weapon that I've had a camera with me. Hmm. That blows my mind. But yeah. it makes sense. Um, and that's got to be a really weird feeling. There's a control aspect there too. Like, yeah, if somebody else is with you, is he gonna is he going to capture it like you want it to be captured? And then will that maybe ruin the moment for you or the memory for you? So that's interesting you bring that up because all the people that have filmed me over the years, I've trusted. Like, I don't have to worry about them. Um, so that really hasn't been a, that hasn't been a, uh, a problem. Um, I could see having a person that you don't have a rapport with or you trust or you've seen their work. And I just try to really disconnect myself because like when I was filming, you know, I was filming in some of the most beautiful whitetail landscapes you could ever film in. And still like being on that hunt, you're not in hunt mode. You're thinking totally different. Like, <laughs> There's not a lot of times I remember looking back if I'm filming Casey that I was like, man, what's the wind doing? Or what's the, what moon phase are we in? No, it's charging batteries and making sure I got enough GoPros and packing my pack the night before we leave in the morning to go hunting and uh, making sure my clothes are clean and making sure I'm doing things that, you know, the way Casey wanted them done because – when when I was filming someone, I don't care if I was filming you or DJ or Casey or whoever it is, I'm an extension of you. So like I have to like if I was to come film you, Brett, tomorrow, I'd be like, How do you do things? And I'm gonna model my way, adapt That's myself to how you do it, even though it's not how I do it. Yeah. Because when you're out there on a could be a hunt of a lifetime. I don't want to be the person to screw that up. And in all the years that I've filmed whitetail hunting, I only remember screwing up one for sure, two possibly hunts. Two, for the, for one, the hunter. For the hunter. Mm. One for sure. The other one could have been me, could have been him, could have been the wind, could have been, but only one for sure. And it was a big deer. It's a real big deer. And it was 100%, dude. And it was like losing the Super Bowl. I came back to camp that night. And I was barking at people for no good reason. And, and at the, like, I woke up the next day and had to apologize because I was so upset about it. Yeah. Is there a confrontation that happens when that happens? Like, is it, was it a situation where, you know, you did it, they knew you did it. Do you look at each other? And is there like unspoken eyeball words being shared? With Casey and I, I mean, I can't speak for him, but him and I filmed together everything for 12 years. Like I was, I was an extension of him. Like him and I were literally attached to the hip every day. Um, we got so good. It was like Stockton and Malone. Like it was, it was, we didn't even have to speak. We just knew it was going to get done. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't want to speak for him. I probably, he probably saw how upset I was and probably was just like, it's all right. Yeah. Because, and like I said, I'm not going to speak for him, but he missed some deer and some opportunities that mm-hmm. like, you know, you're there to do a job just like myself. I'm there to hit record and not fuck things up. You know what I mean? And yeah. I did, but he's on the, on the flip side, you know, he missed a buzzer beater too, a couple times, mm. you know? So it's like, you know, me filming, you're going every step of the way with them as well. You know, you could be hunting a month straight, you know, and you, and you're hunting one deer. That was Casey's thing. He loved to hunt one deer, find one deer and we're going to kill that deer. And, you know, a lot of days it was Groundhog's Day. A lot of days it was like, oh, here comes a great, you know, 140. And there's, he'll even tell you, if you ask him, like, I tried to get him to shoot a lot of deer. I'm not kidding you, Brett. There was one time in Ohio, opening night. No, it wasn't opening night. It was the first night for us in the tree that year. Dude, this mid-140s three-year-old comes out. Beautiful deer. Beautiful deer in a food plot. I'm over Casey's shoulder. This is no shit. No shit. I grab his bow and I put it out in front of him and I just say, just take it. (laughs) Just take it. Like I would do things, you know, playing. Sure. Playing, but like, hey man, let's shoot one of these things. You know, like, and he'd start laughing in the tree, you know, and the deer's like, you know, freaking out a little bit. And I'm like, just take it, you know? Like we do things like that to each other, but. You know, there was never a confrontation between him and I. I don't, I don't know if I, Casey and I ever got like confront. You know, we had a confrontation between the 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 two of us. I will say later, you know, the first like four or five years, I just did my job. Yeah, he he's hunting, I'm filming. That's it. But there came a time where Casey started asking my opinion on things, like, "Hey, what do you want to do? What do you think this? What do you?" And that's when it got a little more fun for me where it was like, I was part of the decision-making now. And he asked my opinion on a lot of things. And that was awesome because the role reverse sometimes where he would film me, you know, and, and I'd be hunting. So then it was role reversal. And it was like, I would ask his opinion on things for a lot of times. Cause he's been there and he's a great whitetail hunter and he's been there and done a lot of things. And I respect the hell out of what he's done. So I learned a lot from him. You know, so, and same thing. He'd ask me like camera questions, like my, the great Hambino hunt, he filmed that, you know, and there was times like I asked him hunting stuff and he asked me filming stuff. So it was just kind of one of those relationships. Yeah. It's, it's impressive when you can spend that much time with another adult male and not really get into it. Like that's a lot of time to be spending with a single person. Um, You know, you're tired, you're sore, you're malnourished perhaps um, yeah. you know the tensions can get a little high so that's impressive that's a seems like a pretty unique relationship that you guys were able to have over the over the years man that's that's awesome and yeah, I, it, it comes was. through in your videos like you can see it that you guys are like you look like brothers up there well i appreciate that i, I mean you know and there was a lot of times where it's just like i just went with the flow yeah I, I won't lie there was times where it's like you know maybe we didn't get up to go hunt in the morning i'm like man we're here hunting like let's go hunting like I let's go let's go do let's get you know and it's like well you might be two three weeks in and you've been hunting every day and it's like yeah Yeah. but I'm like I also want to fucking get home to my family too right like because Casey and I's thing we'd leave anywhere from October 15th to the 20th we'd leave and we'd either go to Kansas Illinois Iowa if he drew but we weren't coming back like until the day before Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. that's how it was every year like there was eight I think seven or eight years in a row that I never hunted a rut with my bow, Maybe. you know? So now, now a lot of people ask like, <laughs> and that's one thing coming over to latitude. I told Alex, I said, I just don't want to travel much anymore. I I've, I missed out on a lot. You know, I did get to see a lot of cool things, but mm-hmm. I want to start killing some shit. You know, I want to start doing things for myself a little bit too. And he was awesome with that. All those guys are like, well, we don't really want you to travel that much. We want you behind the camera, or behind the, computer and and doing more things in the marketing side and i'm like great let's do it you know well you know i'm like so, playing catch up now i'll say that well you're at a a point in your life as a as a father and a husband and i think it's like prime time to be home and, and experience mm-hmm. all those things like we kind of talked about before we hit record um 
podcasting is a a medium that has been around for a while. Um, you know, I started it a long time ago. You've been doing it a really long time. There's a lot of guys who've been in this podcasting community for a very long time, especially as it relates to the outdoors. Um, with what you just shared with us, how does that, how do you transition or even begin to think about podcasting? Was there, was there uh, radio broadcasting in part of your college courses? Uh, was there voiceover stuff that you did on the videos? Like, how do you get into audio, the audio medium, the podcasting medium? So there was, you know, classes, audio classes, stuff like that, that I had to take. But honestly, I'd be lying to you if I said I like paid attention. Like mm -hmm. that was just like a requirement I needed to get through it. The whole podcasting thing for me was a scapegoat, I think, if that's the right word to use, to get out of the TV everyday hustle and bustle. Mm. So, you know, I love sports. I've said that a million times if you listen to my podcast. And it's like, you know, when I got out, oh, even through college, when I got out of high school and when I was even playing college baseball a little bit, I was like, playing travel men's softball leagues, like leagues. And we were doing like travel teams, you know, we were traveling all over Michigan and other States. And I was playing with my uncle and their group. They had a really good team. And, um, you know, me being a younger kid and pretty athletic and they wanted to, you know, another outfielder is a quick guy kind of thing. So I just traveled and did that, you know, just at the time, kind of a single guy, just hanging out on the weekends and beer league, beer league, you know, doing the, doing the thing, you know, I, know, um, I definitely had some friends who did travel men's softball for sure. Yeah. And I, 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 I lived it up, man. I was, it was a lot of fun, but it got to the point when my daughter, we had my daughter in 2017. Well, the travel thing stopped. I mean, you get to a point where it's like, you're getting a little older and you a little harder to get up in the morning and after a game or something. So like my close friends and I, we had a league like in our local town. Well, we were all starting to kind of have kids and and guys were kind of starting to like pluck off. So the team was kind of like slowly fading. And and um I remember telling my wife, I said, you know, when we have our have our kid, you know, I'm gonna there's gonna be no more softball, there's gonna be no extra curriculars. I don't golf, I don't bowl, I don't do any of that stuff. It's like it was like softball and you know, and that was kind of it. That was kind of the competitive edge. Well, at the time, you know, I had been into this TV world for years and I knew I was going to have a newborn at home and I wanted, uh, there were, there was a, there was a, something missing in my life as far as there was just a gap of the, I don't want to say deer camp because everybody is beating the deer camp thing to death right now. I love it to death. I love deer camp. I think it's a dying thing. It's which sucks. I grew up in a deer camp. But I was missing that Michigan, how I grew up. Um, I was missing that side of things. Cause you gotta remember, this was in the heart of like me not being able to hunt much back home with my dad, my uncles, my friends. Like I'd be getting to I'd be hunting through my phone, living vicariously through my friends and my dad. Opening day ref season, I'm in a tree in Missouri filming, wishing I was at home what's everybody seeing yeah you know yeah. and it it was a it was tough so the podcast was almost like that that escape from that world of filming to get back to my roots that's that's how that came about i wanted to in my mission statement getting into podcasting was i'm not getting any big names and you got to think I don't want to name drop, but I had at my fingertips with Chris and Casey at the drop of a hat. And they even told me, do you want Lee Likoski? We'll call him. He'll be on. Do you want Mark Drury? They're friends of Mark Drury. You can get them. So to this day, I've never had him on. And it's nothing against those guys, but I wanted what I was missing. And that was my buddies. The dudes that nobody's heard of and you'd never know anything about at the time, but you know, all these stories, you know, mm -hmm. like 
all that stuff on how I grew up. And that's kind of how that was birthed. And I told myself, I just didn't want any, I didn't want to paint myself in a corner getting all these TV guys on. Cause it's not that the TV guys didn't know anything, but at that time, the TV thing, it was like, those guys were getting a bad name because they were the ones on TV hunting the big manicured farms. And still to this day, it's that same way. I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of TV guys that can hunt a lot of these public land guys or private land guys that nobody knows a lot about right into the ground. Sure. It's just they've got a break to where they can go do that. Mm -hmm. You know, they maybe it takes money to do that. Everybody knows that, you know. Um, so I don't give them a bad name. You know, I grew up in that era, you know, and and seeing the back the 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 back side of it, you know, the the back end and how things are ran and how they do things. And there's some good ones, there's some bad ones, but you know, it's there's a there's a place for everybody out there too. So the podcast just came about because I wanted to get back to my roots a little bit. What was it like when you first started? Did you have to did you have to really learn everything from scratch? Or was there a lot of stuff that you already knew how to do? There's a lot of stuff I already knew how to do. Um, with the Adobe Suite, I edited videos in Premiere. Um, and I I worked in Audition a little bit, Adobe Audition, but I also had a audio technician, Jason Freer, that I worked with at at with the keepers and dude he helped me out a lot he i mean he produces music he's he does his own music he produces music i leaned on him a little bit you know and but i told him i said i i don't want you to tell me everything like if i have a question i'll ask you but i'm gonna try to figure it on my own and um i still don't know audition i know how to do things to be a little dangerous like you know put some more low end or a eq or anything in the to make it sound a little better but you know, so I did have a little bit, you know, a little bit of help on that. But other than that, it was just because I, I've been kind of techie in a way, um, just kind of figure it out kind of deal. Yeah. Um, that's, and that's kind of how, how it went. I will say to start out, like I, I had no money, you know, we were a new family, new baby, no money. Like I think I, I bought my first recorder. It was a H, um, 4N. It was it was a ten, it was ten years old. I think I bought it for a hundred bucks. Um, I bought uh, you know, uh, like a like a headphone cable. You know, like I I jammed that or got that off my headphones so I could plug that into my phone into the phone dongle. And I didn't have Wi Fi, and I only could record when I had good service, and it sounded terrible. I started in my closet with pillows around my head, laying on my stomach, you know, banana down basically. So all those podcasts, is, you know, leading up to all that stuff was, was just done. I was, I was quiet. I was monotone because I had a new baby in our small house. And I will say those first, like that first year was kind of rough. And the fact of like, I just didn't let go. I had, I had chains on me. Like I was, I'm supposed to do it this way. Now it's like, I don't even give a shit. <laughs> like, you know, I'm always fascinated because I, there's something weird about turning on a microphone and either talking to yourself or holding an interview with somebody else. And it's not something that is natural to most people. And so it's just always fascinating to me to hear those kind of those origin stories on how people decide that they want to have a podcast. I, I just love hearing the evolution from where you you know, you were going to play baseball and now you're, you're, you're hosting this gr tremendous podcast and it's grown. And, and, and what, did you have goals when you first started other than I don't want to have the big names on where you like, I want to have uh, an episode a week, or I want to do, you know, I'm going to do this for five years and it's going to parlay that into something else. Like, did you have an end when you started? A lot of people do. No, I didn't. Honestly, um, to be honest with you, Brett there, I'm, I've been known as like an idea guy and, and it's something I've had to actively work through is like getting it to the finish line. You know, it's, it's not hard for me anymore, but back then when I was like, my wife would even tell you, she's like, you, you've got great ideas and great intentions and you work your ass off. And then just one day you're like, oh, don't want to do it anymore. And I'm like, I could see that, you know, she kind of called me out on a little bit and I'm like, I just told myself if I had one goal, I'm not quitting at this. This is something I'm going to put everything I can into it. Um, 
and just see it to the end. I don't know when the end is. I still don't. I have discussions with her every once in a while, like, how do I end this? When will I know that the fall podcast is over? Like, how will I know that? Like, because I still very much enjoy having conversations with people. And, you know, my goal, I think, was to try, like, at that time, I mean, I know there was a lot of podcasts out there at the time, but the only ones I really knew of at the time was, you know, Wired to Hunt, um, I'd have to think of some more. Wired to Hunt was there. I think Deer Hunter Podcast was there. Um, but my my goal, I don't know if I made it my goal, but my goal was just to have fun and I don't know. I didn't I didn't really have a goal, I guess. Just to not quit. I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to quit. I wanted to, I didn't have a goal to become rich or make money at it. I I never once ever thought about making money at it. Shit, that didn't, I didn't make a dollar at podcasting until like year four. And I'm, I just got done with year six, you know, into year seven. So like, but I, I, I did want to see the downloads go up. You know, I, I did very much that kind of, inspired me like okay people are listening to this i think the first month that i ever put out podcasts i think i got like 284 downloads Mm -hmm. like the first month and then it went up a little bit more and then it went up a little bit more and then a little bit more and you know i didn't know how to do it i remember reaching out to i'm not going to name any names there's some podcasts out there i remember reaching out to those guys um because i didn't know anything i didn't know what to do i podcasting was still relatively pretty new and you couldn't Google anything at the time to like, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? And like, what recorder do you use? And how yeah. do you record a remote conversation like this? Cause Oh my God, dude, I was so back then I had no money. I didn't, I didn't want to pay for zoom. I didn't want to pay for, I was trying to do everything free. You know, you had to pay for a host. A lot of people don't know you got to pay. Like I did the cheapest pod bean host and it was still like 250 bucks a year, you know? And there's no return on investment for that. Like no. now with megaphone, it's over six hundred dollars a year that I have to pay just to just so people can listen to it. Just so the podcast goes out to people. People don't understand that. No, they think, they think we're just goofing around and recording it and putting it out. I know. It's interesting. I still have. I think on my home screen of my phone, um, how to record a mix minus, um, like when I first ever started doing a podcast and. <laughs> having the audio come out of zoom into my mixer and go back out like because and i swear if you go to listen to probably somewhere within the first 75 episodes of the first podcast i ever had there's a lot of sorry we had technical difficulties again this week so we have to because i would forget from one week to the next mm-hmm. how to do one thing <laughs> it's one stupid thing there's 900 chords coming out of this going into my old laptop into this mixer and like you said, everything, it's not free. You could get, there's free ways to do it, but it's not quality. Uh, yeah. There's definitely, uh, the, when you pay, it uh, it's, it certainly sounds better. Um, I don't even want to add up how much I've spent on podcast gear over the years. Like, yeah. But you, you know, don't golf and you don't. I don't do a, anything. Exactly. This is your thing now. Yeah. Hunting and yeah. podcasting. And um, dude, I, and like yourself, I've made so many, like I know you through the podcast. You know what I mean? And like everybody I've met through the podcast and not everybody, but DJ, DJ mm-hmm. and I didn't not even know people. We existed before then, you know, Troy. Pond, See, I didn't know that. One. Yeah. Like DJ and I've only been friends for probably two years, two and a half years. But <laughs> like I would call DJ like one of my best friends, like yeah. if not my best friend, like him and I just hit it off. We're just we talk to each other literally every day, every day. My wife's like, how do you talk to someone like that? And I'm like, I don't see him every day. He lives far enough away where we want to see each other maybe once a month, maybe. But it's just like, how's family? We we talk about a Michigan football, a Michigan sports a lot. And like, you know, and just how how's it going? You know, so yeah. a lot of cool relationships getting made over this stuff. Well, that's huge. Like you said, keeping it fun and um and the friendships, because honestly, that's something that's been huge to me is keeping it trying to keep it fun recently i have found myself stressed about not being able to book people um to talk to 
And I was taking it really personal. I was taking it really hard. And I was like, you know what, dude? <clears throat> You're making this way too much like another job. And uh, that wasn't what this was supposed to be. And so I just kind of let it go and took a couple of weeks off. And and here we are. But, you know, I think, like you said, keeping it fun is is critical. But how yeah. do you how do you stay creative? Like, what are you what are some you said you're an idea man. I, too, like to think of myself as an idea man. And I got to hear like, how do you stay creative? Like, what do you do? What is your routine? Um, Get fresh. It's do my mind never shuts off from it. Like you'll have to ask DJ about some of the, like he doesn't help me host anymore just because he's doing the method thing. And, you know, he'll come on every once in a while, but like when he was doing it there for a year, year and a half with me, like a lot of our conversations were, Hey, like I want to, I want to try this. What do you think about this idea? I mean, it was constant. Like, I think it's just, honestly, I think it's just, I take into consideration like what I want to ingest, like, because I'm so ADD. Like if it's not efficient for me to listen or watch, I do not do it. And I almost kind of put like all the listeners hats, like that's how they are, you know? So that's how the season, our season updates when I started it in 2022 were, were, how that series was born. So I also wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something like that one is my favorite to do um, the season update ones. And it's not for my own, my own, like hearing me talk, but it's because a, not that I know of anybody, but nobody's doing it. It is like basically as, as live as it gets, Mm -hmm. it's that day update of that day. And there's a reason why nobody does it is because Brett, it is a pain in the ass to do it. Like last year when DJ and I were doing it in Kansas for 10 days straight. And I have my 10 closest friends. We're all living in one house and everybody wants to drink beer when you get back and, and have dinner and then talk and then watch a game. The last thing you want to do is record a podcast about what just happened that day. But guess what? I generated over like 40,000 downloads in 11 Holy days shit. that day. And, and, and people, and it's not about the download, but it was more about the people. Like we had people reaching out to us saying you and DJ have to go on a hunt every year from now on, just so we can have the season series because they, I don't know how many comments we got about, you know, it was like a Netflix series that we needed to binge. We just, I just could not wait to get up in the morning to drive to work, to hear how your guys's day was like, I wanted that so bad. And uh, that was like, what was cool, but nobody's doing it Cause it's a lot of work. You, it, you have to record it. You have to, you know, ingest it, edit it, put it out. And I do it as raw as I can. But yeah. so th- like the creative side of that was, Midwest Whitetail does it on the video side. Why can't I do it on the audio side, but even do it quicker? So Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do the season. So I started with the season thing and I'm like, well, let's keep it to 20 minutes. Every time I do something hunting related during the fall, I'm going to put it out. And it just went nuts. The next one was the one giant mistake thing. And when you listen to podcasts, all you hear is success, success stories. And you never hear about the one that got away or the one bad instance you had nobody wants to talk about it and it's like if i could get guys to talk about it and make it kind of fun thing would go off well the first season we've done two seasons of it now the first season unreal unreal i mean we were like so many downloads you know and season two like same thing it it was it was a lot of fun but i did start realizing in season two Cause I wanted like the, the top 1% of the deer. Like mm-hmm. I wanted like one eighties, one nineties, 200 inch, like those, those ghost stories. Sure. But a lot of guys don't want to talk about those ones, you know, and I get it. So it's like the size of the deer kind of is going down, which is not a big deal, but it does make it a little bit better when it's like a 200 inch deer or oh, something, yeah. you know? So that was another thing that like people weren't doing and you just call it one giant mistake. Like, let's just call it how it is. You, you fucked up you know, and you own it, but it's fun because everybody screws up. You know, if you can just have fun with it, like that's, that's kind of neat. So 
my creative process, I don't know if there's really anything there. I just kind of like, I might see something and I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. How could I put that into podcast form or how, and, and I have to do that. I have to do different things because that's how I keep the podcast fun for me. If I had to do week to week episodes, just talking tactics for a year, dude, shoot me in the face. I've heard you like, say it. I've heard you say that like you want to shut her down for six months or five months or whatever it is because you don't want to do it. I get it. It's it's not yeah. that I'm against the tactics because there's a time and a place for it. But like, I'm not really the X's and O's guys guy. Like there's guys out there that are like A plus B equals big buck and mm -hmm. in Hill Country and Kentucky or early season. It's like, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that gets an opportunity. I'm going to figure out how to kill that deer. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use everything that I've learned over the years. That might be something from Troy out in Idaho. That might be something from DJ. It might be something from Brett down in Illinois on a public land giant or something like I'm going to take all those. And in whatever situation I'm in that day, I'm going to try to kill that deer. And I think that's kind of neat, but that doesn't you, sell. Do you that like, doesn't put ashes in the seats. <laughs> that's true. Do you, uh, do you use like the notes in your phone? Do you have like a whiteboard? Like, are you, um, are you, um, uh... Are you sort of like a mastermind where you've got little things everywhere that you kind of like, you kind of let marinate for a while and you, and you look at them. Like I have to write shit down fucking everywhere. Yeah. Then I have to look at it for a while or I have to do it instantly. Like I have I'm to, the same get, way I have to get something out immediately or I have to let it make like, what, what, what are you, what camp are you in? So my notes in my phone, dude, I've got notes all the way back to 2017 on podcasting in my, in my phone. Like my notes are is where it usually starts. Now, if I'm at my computer and I see something, I have one of those big like calendars, yeah. um, you know, that I write my day-to-day -day stuff on for weeks on end. Like I'll, I'll write if it's family or work, I'll run a, I'll write out a month in advance. Well, there's dude on the sides, there's notes all over. I mean, it's just chicken scratch everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, sticky notes. If I was to pan you over to my computer, there's a million sticky notes right there. And three of them are list of guests that I want to have on. So like if, if I'm flipping through Instagram one day and I'm like, Oh, who's this guy? Click on him, kind of vet him out a little bit. What's his name? Boom. I'll try to find a nugget on that guy. Mm -hmm. If I can find a nugget on that guy that I think's interesting, I'm going to have him on. If I don't think he's interesting and I think he's a cookie cutter guy and there's nothing, I'm a cookie cutter guy, but a lot of people are cookie cutter guys. I'm looking for that 1% nugget. Yeah. Like he shot a deer on a railroad track. I got to know more about that. Hell like, yeah. you know, I talked about, I don't know why that just came to my head, but I talked to a guy from down in Texas. He hunted a military base. I don't know much about hunting military bases and I haven't heard a lot of people. So I'm like, I want to talk to that guy. Right. Um, stuff like that, you know, so that gets jotted down and then for the guests, like I'll just fit it in, but for series and stuff like that, it's just something that, um, you know, the season was also, I wanted to try to get more content out there quicker in a year. Like I wanted to do more, you know, I think DJ and I did 109 episodes last year, which is stupid. I don't know if I'll ever do that again. That was so many. It was almost like, it was like two and a half episodes a week. It was ridiculous. But, you know, there's there's a good balance. Um, but I also don't want to boil the ocean. I don't want to paint myself into a corner ever of like, I feel like I've been really talking about a lot of scrapes lately on our pod, podcast. But honestly, it wasn't by design. It's just because scrapes consume my life. Mm -hmm. Like literally that is how I hunt, you know? Um, well, I shouldn't say that's not how I hunt. I, I'm, I hunt a lot of different forms, but it starts with scrapes. It literally starts with scrapes. And I, I feel like I've been just beating a dead horse on that. So I feel like I'm getting to the point where I got to like switch it up. Like I got to get somebody else on there. You know how there's, um, you know how there's like, uh, like, like the working class guys who are, um, you know, uh, whimsical and also vulgar and definitely my style and swear. And then there's people who don't have swearing on their hunting podcast. Do you, do you find that when you are trying to put on the product that you put out that, and, and that, that, that 
brand new hunters may hear for the first time. Are you ever concerned with where you may go with a guest or how you are perceived? Or are you like, I'm just going to do whatever I do. And however it comes out is however it comes out. Are you, do you concern yourself with that in today's society at all? Um, yes and no, but I don't feel like I am. I don't feel like I am over the threshold. Mm. Um, like Kurt and those guys, oh, like yeah. it doesn't bother me, but they're over the threshold. I got gotcha. you. You know what I mean? Like, and that's not a bad thing. I love Kurt. I love all those guys. Yeah. He says some things <laughs> that I wouldn't say on the air, you know? Um, and that's fine. That that's sure. their style, but I don't say the things that like he says, like in a normal setting, not saying he does, but right. what you hear me say, like I say fuck around my mother-in-law. Yeah. She says fuck back to me. Like not all the time, you know, but that's, those are the people that I'm around. Right. So do I care? Do Okay. Do I worry? Um, no. The, I think where I worry if at all is like, you know, I take my daughter to school every day. I swear around my daughter. I, tr we try not to. It's not like we deliberately just throw it out there. But if it slips out, it slips out. She calls us out. She's like, dad can't say shit. And I'm like, okay, note taken. Thank you. <laughs> um, but like, you know, if I can't listen to working class when I'm taking her to school. So that's what I kind of worry about those listeners. Cause I've had people like dads, like I can't listen to you. You swear too much. I'm like, yeah. I swear too much. I might say one F bomb, a pod, an episode. Yeah. You know, maybe two, you know? So I don't, I don't worry too much about it because that's me. Um, if you get me in deer camp and get a couple beers in me, I probably say a little more F bombs than a normal. More, more um, about. It's one of my favorite words though. I really do. I it's like all it. encompassing. Yeah. So, it's the duct tape of the American vocabulary. It can it really put is put it everywhere, and it means exactly what you think it means. It really does. So, but those people that say that to me, and there's only been like two or three, to be honest with you, in six or seven years, it's like to those people, I don't know if those are the people that I would share deer camp with. And so, I it yeah. worries me, but it doesn't worry me. You know what I mean? If I, sure. I always say I live by like I can't trust you if I can't drink a beer with you. Oh, hey. Like. That is kind of my deal. So, like, if you're at deer camp and and I'm not against people that don't drink, you know, that's fine. If you want to come to deer camp and not drink, that's fine. Do whatever. But if you if you can't sit there and you judge me for, you know, kill, you know, deleting a thirty rack with my best friend after I killed a deer one night, then that's on you. That's not on me. Absolutely. It's just you such know. a weird world that we live in today. That you know, when we do, we're we're talking amongst friends about things where you are as open and candid as you can possibly be. And every word is, is used. And so, you know, you're very professional and you work for a tremendous company who is, is prominent in the industry. And so I just wonder if somebody like you thinks about that proactively or is concerned about maybe a guest that they may have. I'm just curious. I, I do think about it, but I will say with latitude, we, we, in our marketing meetings every week, we, and you know, I'm, I'm editing grit and our, our digital series. And when you guys, when you guys watch it this year, you're going to be like, what did I just watch? Like, it is so different from anything else. Um, that it, that's what makes it cool. And, you know, we are edgy. You know, the Lone Star Saddle that we came out with, like there's six shooters and guys smoking cigars and or a doobie on it, you know, it on babes, the box. Hot babes. It was it's hot babes in one of the ads. I'm like, that's at, that's at my deer camp. That is, we shot that at my Michigan deer camp. And it's like, and when Alex saw that, he's like, that chick's got to be in our, our ads, <laughs> you know? And it's like that, because what we're doing at Latitude and the what you see with the Maverick and the Lone Star and the Method and whatever we put out is is what the the vast majority of hunters are thinking, but our society 
tells him to dial it back. And we're showing the hot babe on the old Milwaukee sign. And they're like, fuck yeah. Yeah. I'm buying that because of that. Cause I can't say it, but I like that. Cause that's what I'm thinking. You know, yep. like that's how we approach it Love at that. latitude Good. in my own words. Uh, I don't know if Alex, he'd probably put it a lot more sophisticated than I would, but I'm glad that Alex and Kevin, Jake, they just kind of let me do my thing. Like, and, and Alex tells me every day, like, he goes, dude, you're so professional with people. Like, we'll, we'll be in a meeting with like a uh, someone that's not part of latitude. And they're like, you're so professional. How do you, and I'm like, I, I don't even think about it. It's, I just think it's like having personal, personable skills and being around sure. people and knowing who you can throw an f-bomb around like when i first met you shit you and i met for the first time face to face at the mobile hunters expo mm -hmm. i mean i probably said some f-bombs you know and it's like but i knew that's how you were yeah you know and and i knew you didn't get disrespected from that so definitely not you know and it's just i don't know i i, I act i do think about it but i don't really worry about it i guess yeah i i totally understand and i love it and that's part of the reason that i you know I'm a huge supporter of, of you guys as a, as a brand and, and, you know, um, you know, you guys as podcasters as well. That's, that's what really resonates with me as well. And I, I similarly, I, I like to create things that I too would find funny or, and, or offensively funny and entertaining. Like that's, I, I that's just the way my brain works. And so I love it, man. I love that you're doing mm -hmm. that now, now with the plethora of podcasts, what is the number one thing on a podcast that will totally turn you off or make you turn it off mid podcast? Like, what do you, what can you not stand? You oh, don't have to man. name names. It's like, what is one of the worst qualities of a podcast? I can think of like 10 right off. The yeah, top. dude. I don't even know if I'm going to say them right, but something that's like, and I don't want to paint myself in a corner because I, I may, I might like, I, I try not like, well, if, if somebody has to tell me first and foremost, if somebody has to tell me how good they are and what they shot, you're done. You, you have no validity with me, like nothing. You know, my dad always told me like, if you have to tell someone how good you are, you're not very good. You better keep working. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so, and, but, but me as a host, having bread on, I want to know what you shot. You know what I mean? That's different. Let You're me, teasing it let out. Me get, sure. Exactly. Let me get that out of you. Don't yeah. be the guy that comes forward and like, Hey, look what I shot. You know, the yeah. guys that I think are put on a pedestal in the hunting industry is a turn off. Mm -hmm. Whether they, whether they want to be there or not, I think is kind of, I don't think uh, to me, to me, there should be no hunter out there that, compares or sh there should never be who's the best hunter out there mm -hmm. because nobody's situation is the same no, oh, yeah. john eberhart may have killed more record book bucks than anybody but you know i don't still think that makes him the best hunter you know he could have not saying he did but he could have shot these things in a high fence and nobody knows mm -hmm. he shot a lot of those deer back when there was no like validation to anything mm -hmm. not saying that against john so john mm -hmm. don't take that the wrong way if you hear this that's not what we'll i'm saying hear this. <laughs> all i'm saying is like you know there's a lot of people out there that there's no way of validating their work yeah you know but what they spew so yeah. i will say like guys that are like you know this is how you kill a big buck. A plus B equals big buck. I think it's a turn off because that, and then, you know, okay, if A plus B equals big buck, then why aren't you doing it on a very high clip? And there's no people out there that's doing that, you know? Yeah. So that's like a turn off. I just wish more guys would come on and be real. I screwed up, man. I didn't kill a deer this year, be, not because, uh, you know, coyotes came in and took over my area. Shit happens. I get it. Or, uh, you know, got, I feel like there's a lot of guys that plant seeds before the season. Oh, I'm starting to shoot trad. Really? Why? Well, I'm just trying to find myself a little bit or, you know, or to me, it sounds like you're planting a seed because you have an image to uphold and you know what I mean? Like the seed yeah. planters, like mm -hmm. there's guys out there like that. And I could, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of people, 
dude, if you don't shoot a buck this year, it's okay. You know, Instagram might not forgive you, but if you're living for Instagram, you're doing this for the wrong reason. Oh and I feel God. sorry for you. Yes. Yes. You know, so the seed planters, the guys that are like, this is what you have to do to kill a big buck. You know, I just don't, I don't write into that. And, um, there's a lot of hypocrites, even podcast hosts, there's podcast hosts. I'm not going to name names that are the biggest hypocrites. Some that I know personally, and it just drives me nuts. You know, and it's like, why yeah. are you, why are you trying to fabricate something? And why are you trying to be someone that you're not be you dude? And if that's not cool for, you know, let's say you lose a thousand downloads a, a month. Who cares? Those thousand people you kept, those are your rider dies, man. That's what you should be living for is your rider dies. Love it. I love it. I, um, if uh, if someone is, you know, listen, I, I realize that everybody starts somewhere. I think there's probably a a huge group of guys who really want to do this on a, on a regular basis. And they're just trying to get their foot in the door. But I have a real hard time with audio quality. <laughs> oh, just, dude, I'm the same way. If it's real thin um, and like, you know, I can tell that they've got one of those like egg mics, like in the middle of a metal table on a patio in a screened in porch, then I, it's hard, man. It's, it's just hard to listen to. And that's, it is. that's one of my, that's one of my biggest turnoffs. And that's really shitty of me to say, cause I know everybody starts somewhere, but no, uh, I, I, I agree with you though. If there's, there could be a guest on a podcast that I really want to listen to majority of the time, if I listen to the first two minutes of that and the audio quality is not where I like it, I will not listen to it. Yeah. I know it makes us sound a little pompous, doesn't it? It does. But to me, and and I get it. You might be recording with somebody that's literally out in the sticks and has a terrible yeah. internet connection. It's happened to me. Yeah. But, but my whole thing is it doesn't have to sound like you and I sound right now, or maybe you sound, I don't know if you can hear my, my oh, yeah. mic at all, but it, it doesn't have to sound that way, but it, it, it can be computer audio, but yeah. like the host has to have a mic in his, in his suck hole. Yeah. Like that's the least you can do for your audience. And I don't want to hear anybody saying, well, like oh, I was in, I was in a tent on the road doing this. I don't, I don't feel bad for you. I have a headset mic that I can take with me. DJ and I, if you go back and listen to our season episodes, we started recording them in the truck. When we got in the truck after that night, sit for 20 minutes recorder. There's a million cords in the truck, but guess what? It was good audio. There was mics. It sounded good. And we did it the most remote. You can do it. Like, you know, I've taken my, I've took the podcast stuff on dropped you know, out in the widest, weirdest places ever. And we've recorded stuff that sounded amazing mm -hmm. in places people have never set foot before. So that really, you have to give your, in my opinion, the host has to give the listener at least that side. You have to. Again, I hate sounding pompous, but it is an audio medium. <laughs> um, you know, I've taken up a tremendous amount of your time this evening. You probably have to piss. No, I'm good. Okay. If you want well, to keep going, we can go for another hour if you want. I've, I'm, I've got a, a maybe one or two other, um, maybe one or two other questions here for you. Um, I've asked one other person this, and it just struck me recently. Um, as you know, I shot a, a nice deer in Illinois last year, mm -hmm. and. Um, I had a ton of cameras, pictures of him, like a ton. And there's, and there's, there's bucks that I have in Michigan that I have a ton of trail camera history with like year over year over year. And I can visually recognize them as they've gone from three, four five years, whatever. And so the, the deer that I shot last year was very consistent in a particular spot. I've seen him full body, uh, rack from every single angle. He was very unique. Um, with his crab claws. Okay. Uh, this year I have a, another buck in the exact same area, younger, 
exact same frame, crab claws reversed. So, you know, like if, uh, if one was a little more open on the right and the other one was a little more pinched on the left, it's the opposite on this buck. Otherwise, exactly the same, exactly the same area. It is exactly one year later. If this was your scenario, would you say that that is my buck's brother or son? I'd say it's a son. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I would just say it's a son. <laughs> um, I I have historically thought that as well. The reason, for some reason, though, I have said to myself just this year, why couldn't his father have reproduced, my, my buck's father reproduced multiple years in a row with the same doe, thereby creating a very similar genetic pass you know and he's probably one year younger he's probably four this year this buck that i have on camera i really don't know man i just my head when you said that i've been just i really have to tell myself to go with my gut initially what's your gut feeling initially and when yeah. you said that i'm like it's a son so yeah, that's why same. i said that that's why i say that too i just wanted to get your wheels spinning because he would have reproduced so so again i'm guessing i had my deer aged at five and a half mm -hmm. this deer is for sure four He's way too big to be three. He's a four and a half year old deer. So that means that my buck reproduced at one year old this deer and he's lived in the same area. Wouldn't it seem more likely that it's actually his brother when you say it like that? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to throw something on you. How do you know that deer's four? Oh, I, I'm just basing it off of. So I have my deer sheds from four and they look almost identical okay i'm i'm just saying because this is something not saying you're wrong yeah, yeah, by any yeah. means i i like to ask this question to a lot of people because for the longest time i thought i knew aging deer especially i think it's easier to age deer out outside of michigan like when mm -hmm. you get in the midwest i think it's a little easier to age those deer in michigan i think it's it's so hard it's yeah. so hard to age deer um and i've been wrong Every time more than you've been right. I don't know if I've been right on a, on a deer that, that I've actually killed, got aged. was like, Oh yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. You know, I'm always a year older than what I thought he is. He's always, the deer is always a year younger than what I think he oh, is. Oh, okay. The ones that I've shot. I've heard you say that. Yeah. So that's just why I asked because like, you know, and I always tell myself too, like you can't judge a deer an age by his, by his rack. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can throw that into the equation, but don't let that be your end all. That's what I tell myself. Sure. And because, you know, you hear a lot of people, oh, deer like that couldn't have mass like that at two. Well, how do you not know? Like, we don't know. You know, that deer does not have a birth certificate around his neck. Like, we don't know. He could be a, literally a baby giant. Um, you know, we, we have this picture in our heads of what we think a two-year-old looks or a three-year-old or a four-year-old or whatever. Mm -hmm. Dude, I just think a two- and three-year-old buck is so identical. And even a three to a four is like, you know, you see you have the charts where you can put yeah. them on your wall and they're like this. It doesn't happen at a very high rate, I feel like, that they mm -hmm. look, you know. So that deer that you're, that, you know, is in there now, that deer could be a six-year-old. You know, it, like, I don't know. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, what if that deer is in there right now is actually the dad to the deer that you killed? Oh, my mind is now blown. But you know that what I'm saying? My mind. Like, yeah. You know, so I don't know. I, it, the, there is a weird scenario. So I know a guy um, in, in area here, he shot a deer in like, let's just say, Let's make sure I get this story right. He shot a deer in like 2017. It went 162. Okay. As a Michigan deer, double split twos, sp splits in some er other areas. He shoots another deer. I think it was like two seasons later, the exact same deer, but he was like 140. Okay. So you're like, oh, it's his son mm -hmm. well in fact when he aged it 
the 140 was older than the 160 in the same time. Does that make sense? Really? Yes. Like the deer was actually older. So there's no way he could have been his offspring. Yeah. So that's just why it's just so, we just don't know. That's why I'm like, and, and anything, I'm not just saying deer age. Like mm-hmm. that's why I'm an opportunist hunter. I'm not like, uh, find this, uh, this oh, bench yeah. here and, uh, hunt it on an East wind. Cause the thermals are pulling this way and you only can do it this way because you got to come in from that drainage. And the, like, <laughs> what really? Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. it's just, sometimes it's just m- numbing, mind numbing. Just like, man. Yeah. I just, uh, it was one of those things where I, I have always said that is, dude's son whatever for a person mm-hmm. whatever reason then i just yep. thought to myself this deer uh, visually appears to be younger um but why couldn't it have been his brother because obviously my deer had a dad and was reproducing and whether you know how who knows how many offspring he had it's in the same exact spot uh, but again like you said it could it could be his dad i just uh well I, let's I put it this way i think it is probably same some sort of same bloodline whether they're yeah. brothers dads yeah you know son i i don't know like that's that's cool because that deer that you shot was a stud do you, you do you do get... you thank you uh do you keep track of that kind of stuff on and your family farm as well like do you have historical data like of, of genetics yeah so my family farm our genetics terrible brows we never oh. get deer with brows in relatively shorter times like we're either gonna get like I would say we get like those quite tall deer yeah. normally. I will say though, lately we've been getting some framey deer, some wide deer, uh, hmm. not very tall tine, but like you're pushing 1920 inside, like yeah. getting a little more frame on them. Um, I will say on my ag ground stuff, I get a lot of deer that are goofy. Like, hmm. Every year I will get a deer, if not two deer, um, that have like a great one side. And then the other side's like just all jacked up like do, every year. Too. Um, but is this it, year, um, is there a lot of car deer collisions in that area? Yeah, there is. There is. Yeah. You'll see, I mean, not an overabundance, but you'll see, there's always times you'll see in the same stretch of road that there's always usually a dead deer somewhere, or, you know, around there they come zipping out of the corn and a honda civic takes oh takes yeah its hind quarters yeah Civics I guess, kill a lot of deer that's right it's the number one uh i don't know if anybody knows this it's the number one car in america for uh car deer collisions you can look that are you up. serious no oh, i have no idea oh <laughs> there's, a, there's a good chance but um yeah, yeah I, we have that too uh for years now we've had either the the floppy ear on one side and then the opposite side has a weird, you know, antler, uh, just one mm-hmm. giant sword sticking up. Uh, this yeah. year, we have another one sider again. Uh, that floppy ear deer disappeared. I'm sure he died. He looked like shit, man. He looked in January, he would look like he had CWD every, CWD every year and then he would disappear. And we're like, ah, oh, he's dead. He's dead. And then in mm-hmm. fucking March, he'd show back up and he's already sprouting a massive antler out of one side. I'm like, oh my God, he's alive again. Yeah. That's and, wild. Uh, yeah, it's so crazy. Um, how's your how's your hit list looking this year? Pretty good, man. So I had one giant that that lived last year in Illinois, and I am ninety nine point nine percent sure that's the deer that just showed up last this past week on the first cold front. You know, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that's that same deer who looks like he's probably put on 20, 30 more inches. So he's probably I mean, he's got. He's got a flyer out the back G2 on his right side. He's got flyers on his left side, splits on his brows. I mean, that's awesome. Deer. Yeah, he's probably, he was probably bigger than my deer last year or close to it. Um, and he put on that much more this year. Um, Michigan, I, you know, I've glad. So the last time I was down there, I glassed a really nice deer across the street in the beans but on our property has been real quiet. I, I mm-hmm. imagine that's going to change here. Um, soon as they shed velvet, we'll, we'll get a couple of home bodies, but historically speaking, they don't live on our property. They just pass through. Um, and Ohio, I've got 
some okay deer on camera in Ohio on some public pieces. Um, and then I'm going to shoot the best deer I can put my eyes on in Nebraska this year. That's right. You're going to Nebraska, man. I'm so fucking excited. Mm -hmm. Friday morning, baby. That's awesome. So pumped. When are you guys coming back? Uh, I'm going to probably spend, uh, the majority of the next week there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Scout Friday afternoon, all day, Saturday, Sunday morning, supposed to be real. It was supposed to rain on Sunday opening day, but I don't know. I don't think it's going to anymore. going to cool. It's going to, it's like 109 here tomorrow, today or tomorrow. I don't feel bad for you guys. I'm going to be, oh. I'm, wait, while you guys are doing that, we're camping this weekend. So I'm smoking meat on Saturday. So when you're in the 109 degree heat, I'm smoking two pork butts. I got the Michigan game. I got a TV ready on the side of the camper. Uh, going to be have college game day, and then Michigan's playing Fresno State on, you know, Saturday night. So I'll be drinking beer all day, just hanging out with my family, laughing at us, soaking wet with sweat. It's going to yeah. cool down to the upper 80s, so that'll be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, where else are you going this year? Michigan and Illinois, man. That's okay. That's it. I'm um I'm putting a lot of eggs in the Illinois basket this year. Um, probably do a couple trips. Uh, gonna do trip in October and then do a rut trip and then I am going to Iowa. But my father in law drew a oh, right. uh, a tag for a gun hunt and he's going to Midwest Antler Company with my buddy Chad. Sweet. So I'm gonna go out there and just film them, sit in the blind with them, and and just kind of take in deer camp. That's That'll be the week before Christmas. So that'll be a good, like, uh, uh, just kind of relax, hunt, just have a good time. And just, I hope he really can get on a big deer that, that would make, dude, I don't even have to kill a deer this year. If I, if he could go there and kill a hammer and me be with him, like that would be awesome for me. That's great, man. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool that you're going somewhere, you know, too. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Um, and I should draw Iowa next year. So what I'm going to do is kind of look, Can't look over some farms. I am too, but I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised. I, I figured it was going to be 50, 50. And then all the kind of the rule changes with the party hunting. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but I don't know. Um, I should draw next year with five. Um, but I'm going to look at some farms while I'm there to, to be able to hunt, maybe scout some stuff late season. If there's no snow on the ground, scout some stuff for next year. And is, and is Illinois somewhere you've been before or is it somewhere new? Never set foot on the property. That's it's all awesome. public land. Oh, sweet. That's yeah. awesome. Yep. You it's uh, a group of people. Me and DJ are going. Oh, fantastic. I heard you mention that you were going to go drop in with him, but I didn't know it was. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. So, um, I'm keeping it on down though. Just, oh, that's fine. Just, but it's, I will say it's an area that I've been in before. I've mm -hmm. never set foot on the public land, but some private around the area. I, I know a little bit of that. Um, and I don't know, just something like DJ and I were talking about it this spring. We were trying to figure out what we were going to do. And we wanted to do another hunt together and just something. I don't know, just, there's just something about public land out of state that I just kind of really is romantic to me. And it's nothing, I mean, I'm still going to try to knock on doors while I'm there, yeah. you know, may, you might get something. Um, but there's, there's just something about it that I just want to last year was like a breath of fresh air for me when we went to Kansas and I hunted public literally for the first time. I hunted a little bit in Michigan public a couple years ago at the, at Kevin Vistason's deer camp. It mm -hmm. was two sits, basically throw a dart at the wall and go hunt. But last year it was like a relax hunt. Like I got, I got my ass kicked, went full draw on three different bucks and you know, but it was like one of those humbling experiences of like, Hey, you're not what you crack up to or not what you think you are kind of thing. And that was refreshing. I feel like I needed someone to punch me in the mouth like mm. that. And um, and it made me look through a different lens at that and that experience because I was with literally my 10 closest friends that I grew up with. Um, DJ was there as well. But all the guys that I grew up with when I was since I was little, like we were all in one house together, hunting public together. It was 
It was a time I'll never forget. Hell yeah. And the weather sucked. It was hot. Um, but it didn't let us didn't let us get it get us down, you know? And uh like I said, I just looked at it through a different lens and now going into this year, like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna work my ass off to try to get an opportunity. But Brett, if I come home with a tag so my pocket, I'm I'm cool with it. Like yeah, um you just said that you're not all you're cracked up to be, but if I remember correctly, you were at full draw a few times in Kansas. And yeah. a lot of people, that's still a success. Like Yeah. Just uh, I will say into though, a lower lip dangle and just you know dude, full draw. Never and, forget that spot. Never. I would go back to that spot in a heartbeat. Um I will say, like it that's kind of how I judge success was dragging something out of the, for a long time. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's hard as humans to get away from like what people will think on social media. There's times I still think about it too, you know, and it's like, but I, I don't do it for social media, you know? Um, but there is a, there is a little bit of thought behind like, Oh, what will social media think about when, if I post this mm-hmm. and that's, that's, that's terrible to have that thought, you know, and, and, um, I'll tell you, DJs helped me through a lot as far, as far as mentally doing things for myself. Yeah. Um, cause if there's any guy out there that does things for himself and doesn't give a shit about what anybody else thinks, it's that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's helped me through a lot of that and like being able to like hunt with him side by side. Cause he killed his buck the first morning, yeah. you know, and then he filmed me the whole time. So him and I were, we did everything together, you know, and, and he verbally, he didn't really say a ton about it. It was just kind of how he carried himself and how he did. Um, he approached things, you know, that really I grasp on it. It's like at the end of the day, when I, when we left Kansas, I was happy. It was success, you know, in the time when I went full draw on a really good public land deer and then at 11 yards and didn't get an arrow in him, I was like, wanted to, you know, wrap my tether around my neck and jump out. But, um, that's just a little bit of the competitiveness that I'll never lose. And I hope I never lose because you do this thing for a reason, you know, and it's, it's to, for me, it's to conquer something I've never done before. And the, the cool thing for me now is dropping into areas I've never been. Mm -hmm. I want to go to new farms that I've never been my back against the wall and see what I can do. I want to test myself. I want to, and you know what? I'm, I I might come out with bruised and battered and, and dragging my face in the dirt with no deer, but I know I busted my ass for it and I'm going to come back again next year because as we get older a little bit, and there has been very many, there's been a many goals that I've set for myself way back from way back in the day that I've achieved personal goals where it's kind of like took that fire, that flame and kind of like dwindled a little bit. And I want to get that flame back And I'm trying to get new things of like, what are some things that I have personally never conquered that I want to try, make things a little harder on myself, you know, and, and try to come out on top basically. And you just touched on something that I never even asked you today. Like, how do you, are you concerned that one day that your fire will burn out and i'd be lying to you if i said yeah or uh uh no, no if i yeah. said no because and and i try to figure out where that comes from like why why is why is that even a thought um i i pretty sure i think what it is is ever since 2011 hunting whitetail hunting has been my job 365 days a year literally has that light has not burned out since 2000. You know, it's still going like Mm I, and I still very much love it. You know, I threw the podcast in there too. Like I talk tonight, you know, we're, you know, I are two hours into this and I'll talk for another three hours Mm -hmm. because I enjoy the conversation, but I constantly talk whitetails. I can step out my back door and I can, film whitetails. I can glass whitetails. I can see them from my shower as I'm taking a shower. I legitimately can see them, you know, like I've, in, I've, I've ingested myself amongst whitetails all over. And 
I think the fire, the goal thing has definitely made it blow out a little bit, blow the candle out. But the fact that I've just been consumed for so long in it that I think that doesn't really help it, you know, throw some wood on it and kindle it again. You know what I mean? Like get it, get it going, stoke it. It doesn't help stoke the fire. It helps kind of, so I'm just somewhat worried a little bit of one day waking up and being like, man, I just not there anymore. But I think my hunting is going to change because my daughter you know, she's getting to the age where she's getting curious about it. And if she ever grasps on it, then like, I want to hunt for her. You know what I mean? Things might change. I might not tote a bow or a, a, a weapon. I might play guide to her and mm -hmm. my wife. My wife loves to bow hunt, but she hasn't bow hunted since my daughter was born. My daughter just turned seven today. So like, I would love to be able to go and film my wife again and have her kill a buck with her bow. Like I would love to see that. So my, my hunting may change, you know, I will say like, I'll, I always want to take like one trip out of state every year. Like that I think will always burn because there's, yeah there's new areas that we've never been and there's new States and new, new ground and things. And like, that's the thing that DJ and I are talking about. Like, do we want to go scout it? And we're like, no, Let's just show up, see what happens. I'm like, done. Let's do it. You know, um, it's an away game. Let's go see how we can, tr you know, stack up against the the home opponent. Basically, is the way we're looking at it. So, I feel that. You know, I know this sounds fucking crazy to some people, but I think, I think after this year, I'll probably not go back to the same Illinois spot. Really? It's just. I'm, I, I mean, I've, I scouted it all spring, but it's like the deer are in a pattern there and it's not a question of what are they doing? It's just a question of which one's going to walk in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I think I want, like, I could go back to the same park and hunt a different spot. And so if I do that, I may do that, but I, I may not utilize this incredible opportunity for access that I, I might give it up and let somebody else experience that same area or figure it out for themselves for the first time. But for me to walk in there just consistently and sit in the same overlap of the Venn diagram where the bucks travel is, it's going to, it's going to lose its luster. Mm -hmm. And so I will probably forego this um, because it won't be a challenge to me. And I think that's, that's part of it is, is I want to work fucking hard for the success and that like for whatever that means to whatever level that is, if it's heat, if it's water, if it's cold, like I want to work for it. And yeah. I think two years in a row is, is probably the max because I may still have to adjust after this one. I don't know. I think that's cool though, because you know, the Kansas piece we went to last year, like would I, DJ and I've talked about it. Would I go back personally? I probably wouldn't go back. Um, even though I just said I'd go to the lower left angle again, but I probably wouldn't go back just because like you said, like, but I, maybe I would because I didn't kill anything there. I was so close. Maybe just to put that like stamp, like boom, done it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, let's move on now. I would do that. But like, I agree. There's so much public ground out there or even if it's permission stuff, like dude, you and I could, you and I could drop everything we've done, our working, our family and just say no more. You and I are going to hunt every day of the fall and just hit as many spots as we could over every fall. And we still wouldn't cover, Not even you know, close. I mean, we wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be a percent of a percent of a percent, yeah. you know? So it's like, I think the cool, like, hey, let's throw a dart at the wall, see where we're going to go this year. And honestly, my buddy and I, Kevin, we did that. We're, we're in an archery league, and you probably heard on our podcast, we do a, we did a bet last year, and mm -hmm. this year we're doing a bet. So, like, he came up with the idea yeah. of, you know, whoever wins, the loser has to let the winner come and hunt up a sit on their property. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, and... I, 
honestly, I told Kevin, I'm like, if you win, like, if you want to shoot a buck, you should, I, whatever. But I, I, I just want to go sit and see different trees, yeah. you know? And, and honestly, I think it'd be cool to even shoot a doe. You yeah. know what I mean? Like one sit. And I told him the other day we were texting. I was like, okay. I said, winner. So like, you have to be there in the tree, you know, just kind of, and just hang out with buddies. Yeah. Like just kick it back to the, to what it used to be. And, and I, I almost thought like, get some more buddies to do that. Like once a year, like, but there, so many guys are in different areas in their hunting, like stages, you know, I think Kevin and I are to the point where it's very much like, let's just relax. And like, I'm not going to let him go sit in my honey hole. I will say that, but like, you know, I'm not going to give that up, but right. um, I just think it'd be cool. You know, I agree. So I agree. Well, listen, man, let's, uh, let's wrap this up for the evening. Um, you know, you were gracious enough to join me this evening and give me a ton of time. And I, you know, I, I told you that I didn't really want to talk about, you know, specifics on hunting. We did talk a lot of hunting and that's, that's great. I wanted to really learn more about you because like I said, I didn't, I don't know you that well. And I just kind of recently, you know, met you and, 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 but I really enjoy your, your, your friendship and, um, and, and interacting with you as well. And, and so thanks for kind of getting into some personal stuff tonight about, you know, your journey and, uh, and all that, but why don't you tell people who don't know if they've been living under a rock, a lot of people don't know find me. you. <laughs> That's crazy to me, but, uh, tell us, tell people about the the podcast and latitude and, and everything that you're into and, and where people can, can catch up. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me on. Um, hopefully I didn't let you down or have you. Oh think different of differently of me now, but, um, I appreciate the time and, and having me on, but, uh, yeah, if, if, if you want to listen to, uh, another whitetail podcast, the fall podcast is, is been my baby since 2017. Actually, I think it was the spring of 18 is when I started it, but, um, it's on all the major platforms that you can download a podcast. Um, and then I work for Latitude Outdoors, the saddle company. Um, any go to latitudeoutdoors.com, check out, you know, all everything that we offer. I do a lot of the marketing stuff on the marketing team with Alex and Derek and Corey and and Brandon. And um I do a lot of the a lot of the long form editing and some of the filming for the products. Derek does a lot more filming for our series that uh we do grit on YouTube. If you haven't checked out grit, it's just a YouTube series. We had season one last year. I edited edited and you know produced all that um i'm in the the midst right now of of editing and producing season two um that's going to be rolling out here shortly if it hadn't already when this goes live um but then the method podcast latitude is the method podcast which you know we we mentioned dj a lot uh dj riley is one of my really good friends and he co-hosted on the fall for a while well he's been you know he's so good at being a host we I wanted him and the guys at Latitude wanted him to take over the Method podcast. And we started the Method podcast and, and DJs ran with it, man. He does an amazing job on that. You can download that anywhere you get to your podcast as well. Um, DJ is a wealth of knowledge. He he does things on a very high level. He's a he's a very good hunter, uh, but he's a even better father and husband. And that's what I respect him the most for. Um, but he's a, such a good dude. And uh, so check that out. And yeah, I think that's it, man. Yep, that's uh, that's a fact. Everything he just said there is a fact. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's all facts. Uh, you <laughs> if know, if I called... have a wiki page, I would be surprised. <laughs> uh, you know, you called Latitude the saddle company, and I think you sold them a little short there. Yeah, uh, let's probably. be honest; they are uh, pimps in the game, if you will. <laughs> uh, they do a lot more than just saddles. So, you know, I think we do. Yeah, Aaron just kind of touched on a couple things that they did, um, but I'm a I'm a huge proponent of Latitude Outdoors, and uh, uh, the people and the products are second to none. And I strongly encourage y'all to go check it out. In fact, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday whose father-in-law is, is looking to get a saddle, and I'm trying to get him into the Maverick and uh, some Speed Series sticks and even a platform. Uh, we'll see what he we'll see what he ends up with. But uh, Aaron, thanks again for your time, my brother. And uh, I don't know why I just said that. I don't this my brother. It was cool. It rolled right off the top. It did. 
I had an energy drink uh, during the episode tonight, so I blame that. Uh, but man, I appreciate it, and we will uh, we will talk a lot this season. I look forward to following along with you. Um, thanks everybody for sticking around, and uh, we will talk to you all soon.